today's fast-paced business environment, a well-run accounts payable function is not just a luxury, it's a necessity. That's why we're going to address the critical parts of the function. So let's get started at the most obvious place, invoice processing. The accounts payable invoice process has many, many moving parts. It's so easy to get one or more of them wrong, and even one tiny uh, what seems like inconsequential misstep can create havoc, resulting in either a duplicate payment that is difficult, if not impossible, to retrieve, a late payment, a disgruntled supplier, or even worse, an unhappy manager. We'll go through the steps and the best practices you should use every step of the way to make sure that this doesn't happen to you. Make sure you stick around until the end when we discuss one practice that will definitely make suppliers angry and angry suppliers tend to call management and complain about you. So let's get started. Well, we said that it doesn't matter how the invoices arrive, you can do a lot to ensure that this step goes smoothly. Let's take a look at some best practices you can use in that regard. And let's start off with what address you use. What address are you going to give uh, your vendors to send your invoices to? Well, in today's world, you wanna have three addresses. You want to have a postal address that is very precise. You don't want the vendors sending their invoices to your headquarters address, for example. So your address for where they send their, the, the invoices to should be something like ABC Company, uh, 124 uh, Main Street, uh, second floor, or attention accounts payable, or maybe even it'll be a post office box. Maybe you're going to receive the invoices there. You should also have an email address where your vendors can send their invoices, and that should also be very specific. It should not be an individual's um, email account. So it should be invoices at ABC Company, uh, accounts payable at ABC Company, how, whatever, you, whatever works for you. Um, you also might want to have a fax, although a fax number, although faxes are on um, the decline, if you will, um, as far as being um, a business tool. But you might want to have a, a specific fax number that your your uh, vendors can use um, if they want to fax it to you. And ideally, in an ideal world, you'll have that fax facility hooked up to an e-fax facility so that paper fax gets converted into an electronic document. Now, this may sound easy. You send it out for approval and then move right on. But sadly, like most other tasks in accounts payable, it doesn't always work the way you'd like. Sometimes approvers are busy. Work with me, please. I'm trying to be nice here. And they don't approve invoices in a timely manner or they don't get to other approvals. What can you do about it? Glad you asked. We've got some tips that will help. Let's take a quick look at the three-way match. What is the three-way match? This is the process every accounts payable department should use to ensure that invoices that they are paying are accurate, legitimate, and have not been already paid. As you know, duplicate payment of invoices can be a problem, and it's an even bigger problem now because we have so many suppliers who are sending duplicate copies of invoices. But I digress. Back to the three-way match. Okay, the three-way match involves three documents the purchase order, the receiving document, and the invoice. Let's discuss each of them in a little bit of detail so you can understand what they are and what their role is in this much vaulted, much talked about three-way match. Okay, so the three documents. The first document that starts the whole transaction, if you will, is the purchase order. You'll sometimes see it abbreviated as PO or PO number, because they all have numbers. And basically, this is the document that your purchasing department will prepare and send over to the supplier placing the order, okay, the purchase order, okay? And it will delineate, you know, what they want to order, should have price on it. Many times they'll have terms and conditions, and it sets forth, if you will, the terms for the transaction, or at least the terms for the transaction as far as your organization is concerned. If the supply doesn't agree with anything on it, like let's say the price, they should go back and forth with the purchasing department and the purchase order should be changed to reflect it. So if your guy says the price is a dollar and the vendor says no, the price is two dollars, the price on the purchase order should be changed to whatever they agree the price is. Okay, that's purchase order. Receiving document, sometimes also called packing slip. You've all seen them when you've ordered things online and the stuff comes and there's a little piece of paper in the inside telling you what's in the box that you ordered. I'm sure you've all noticed, well, like if you've ordered from Amazon, that little tiny piece of paper, 
Well, in the business world, it should be a bigger piece of paper. When the goods come in, what the folks on your receiving dock should do, I'm not saying they necessarily do do it, but they should make sure that what is on the packing slip or the receiving document is what they receive. So if it says 15 widgets, there should be 15 widgets in there. If they are broken or there's any other problem with it, it should be noted. And of course, then there's the good old invoice. The invoice is basically the bill that the vendor sends asking for payment. And it should match what was on the purchase order and match what was on the receiving document. So simple example, if there were 100 widgets ordered and supplier only had 75, the receiving document should show 75. But let's just assume for our first example that everything matches. So when the invoice shows up in accounts payable, the accounts payable department then looks in the system for the purchasing order that goes along with it. And hopefully the invoice had the purchase order number on it. So that will make that a little bit easier and the receiving document. They should match all three of them. And when they all three match, they set it up for payment. Now, in most organizations, before the three-way match is done, that invoice is sent to purchasing for approval or to whoever who placed the order for approval. You would think that that person would do the checking and make sure that it matched what was on the purchase order, but that rarely happens or it doesn't happen that often. And that's why the accounts payable department does the three-way match. Okay, so you've got your three documents and you've got your approval and hopefully if everything matches, you can then set it up for payment and the vendor can be paid and everybody will be happy. Let's look at some of the best practices surrounding the three-way match. Best practice number one. And I realize that if you're in accounting or accounts payable, this might fall outside your purview, but it's something to really keep in, in, in mind. You wanna make sure right off the bat from the beginning, that you get, get off on the right foot. This means that the purchase orders must be accurate every single time. An accurate purchase order means one that's filled out completely and also one that the uh, purchaser did not mindlessly check off standard terms and conditions uh, before sending it. If the purchaser has made some special arrangement, if it's, for, if it's for something as simple as extended payment terms, that needs to be reflected on the purchase order. For if it's not, and if the vendor forgets about it and doesn't include it on the invoice, there's no way the accounts payable team is going to know it when they, when they pay the invoice. And that wonderful negotiation that your purchasing department did is going to go up in smoke because the purchase order is going to match the invoice and they're going to go ahead and pay. So that's um, best practice number one. Best practice number two, and again, this might be outside the purview of uh, accounting or accounts payable, but you want to make sure the receiving uh, uh, practice, the receiving doc does what they're supposed to do. This means not just marking off goods, marking off goods in when they're delivered and marking them received, but actually verifying what's in and more importantly, what's not in the shipment. This may involve checking the quantity, the quality, um, et cetera, and any discrepancies should be noted. If you ordered 100 widgets and you only got 95, then you want to make a note that only 95 widgets were received. So when the invoice shows up for 100 widgets, your uh, accounts payable staff can make the appropriate um, adjustment. Okay, uh, best practice number three. Of course, perform the three-way match before paying every single invoice. Um, anytime there is a discrepancies, uh, investigate it and resolve it before you pay the invoice. For many, okay, not necessarily everybody, but many, it is becoming a best practice to use technology to automate and streamline your accounts payable invoice processing. Or best practice number five, implement strong internal controls. Sometimes people think, oh, well, we're doing the three-way match. We don't have to worry about uh, internal controls. That's not true. There must be, you must integrate internal controls, strong internal controls along every aspect of your three-way match and do it every single time. Before we continue, let's take a quick look at the various payment options currently being used by many U.S. organizations. Yes. I believe many payments being made today with checks could be made with either cards or ACH. Do you agree? Is your organization trying to reduce the number of paper checks? Let us know in the comments below. Cards are the perfect payment tool to handle small dollar invoices, which may be clogging up your accounts payable. Used with the proper control, 
you can eliminate a large number of invoices and then have your AP team spend their valuable processing time on larger dollar invoices. There have been many new card product introductions in recent years, so you might want to take a look at them. When reviewing all the advantages of card programs, keep in mind your supplier's needs as well. While many are happy and even prefer to take cards for, let's say, a $100 transaction, you may find their joy fading quickly if you try and get them to take it for a $100,000 invoice, even with a reduced fee. ACH payments have been growing in popularity as many recognize the drawbacks of paying with a paper check. ACH payments are electronic payments, but they are not instantaneous. It is important that you realize that. They have been used successfully for years now for direct deposit of payroll and direct deposit of Social Security. In growing numbers, companies are now using them to pay their suppliers. In fact, in the U.S., ACH payments in the B2B world now exceed 50% of the payments made. While we celebrate crossing this threshold, the rest of the world looks at us incredulously, as most make almost 100% of their payments electronically. I've had non-U.S. people tell me things like, I don't even know where my checkbook is. And when COVID hit, our management said, no more paper checks. ACH can be used in place of many wire transfers as they are quite a bit less expensive and in place of paper checks, as we've already discussed. As you may have guessed, not only has there been a lot of innovation in the payment world, there's a lot more coming in the next few months and years. I would be remiss if at this point I did not point out the danger of making duplicate payments. Saying you never make a duplicate payment is like saying you never make a mistake. Now, you may think that this is no big deal since surely suppliers would return the duplicate payment. Sadly, only a few do. So here are a few tips you can use to avoid that nightmare. I want to start off by smashing that myth that vendors will return duplicate payments. Here's the secret. Most of them don't. Now, a few will issue credits, and then there's issues with credits as to whether your people find them, they take them, etc. But many of them don't. They quietly put the money in their pockets and never say a word about them. And then there are a few who pulled this little nasty trick that happened at one company where I worked. The vendor got the duplicate payment and came in to see the chief operating officer. I don't remember exactly for what, but whatever. And he brought that check, that second check that we had sent, and he threw it on the office's desk. And he said to him, glad to see you doing so well. Glad to see you can afford to pay us twice. Okay, as you can imagine, what happened after the guy left was not pretty. Everyone has three opportunities, three opportunities to prevent, detect, and recover duplicate payments. But you've got to take action to do these. So let's start. I call it the before, the during, and the after. That's my way of breaking these things down. So let's start off with the before. What can you do before you get that invoice and you process it? Well, it's some very simple stuff, okay? You want to incorporate best practices, make sure you have strong internal controls in your processes for handling invoices and making payments. And those, those processes should include strong internal controls and not limited to, but including separation of duties. You also want to minimize or eliminate as many weak practices as you can. Let me give you an idea about some of those weak practices returning checks to the person who placed the order, the requisitioner, as I like to call them, petty cash boxes. All of these are opportunities, if you will, for a duplicate okay. payment. Let's talk okay. about during. What can you do during the processing of an invoice to ensure that you don't pay it twice, or at least help minimize the chances of not paying it twice? So I want to share with you a little story. I was at a conference, this was a few years ago, and I was talking to a guy who was an AP director of a huge company. And the reason I make such a big deal about it was a huge company, because when you see the numbers that I'm going to talk about, you're going to say, what? That wasn't an issue for them. And he told me, he shared with me that they just had a duplicate payment audit done. And his company, the last time they'd had an audit done, which I think was two years prior, the audit firm found $2 million dollars. This current audit, they found $57,000. So $2 million might not be a lot of money to a billion-dollar company. And if $2 million wasn't a lot, $57,000 was really not much. So I was all ears, if you will. And I said, oh, what did you do? 
he said, oh, you know, all that stuff you talk about. And what he meant was using things like rigid coding standards, making sure that when invoices are processed, that the standards that are used are rigid and you've spelled it out and you've given it to your processes so they all know exactly how you want the data entered. I like to say when it comes to data entry and accounts payable, creativity is not desired, not a desirable function, if you will. Limiting the payment types for each vendor also will help. So then you don't have to worry. You made one payment with a check, let's say, and another one with a credit card. You also don't want to allow the payment of invoices either on expense reports or through the petty cash box. Some companies will take it one step further. And when they have what they consider a large payment, and of course, what is large is going to depend upon your individual company. Obviously, a large payment at Apple is different than a large payment at the corner stationery store. So whatever is large, you want to double check those items to make sure that they've not already been paid. I also like to tell people that they should, if they've got rush checks or items that were paid off a check request form because the invoice was lost, that they might want to put them in a folder and then go back and research two, three weeks later, a month later to make sure that that invoice did not show up and get paid. Also, you probably want to have some special processes and procedures in place for payments that are made through wire transfers, because that's a whole nother issue. And also, if you are having payments made outside AP, you want to have some processes in place to make sure that those folks are using the same strong practices and controls that you use in accounts payable. We see at a number of companies, companies will have ACH payments made outside AP, maybe in treasury, maybe elsewhere in accounting. I want to say that that happens at about 20% of the companies. And as more companies are increasing the number of ACH payments, there's also a possibility of increasing that. Now, we're going to talk about after the payments made, because there are some things you can do that. But first, I want to say a big thank you to all our listeners who very thoughtfully give us thumbs up or likes on our recordings. And if you have any other tips on preventing duplicate payments that I haven't shared, feel free to put them in the comment field, or of course, I always like to hear from people. Okay, after the payment's made, the money's out the door, but it doesn't have to be out the door forever if you paid twice, which hopefully you didn't, but at a minimum, you wanna audit your payments. When I say at a minimum, I hope everybody who's listening today is doing statement audits. And that's where you call your vendors and you ask them to send a statement showing all outstanding activity, all open activity, not just open invoices. They're happy to tell you about the open invoices, but you want to find out, are there any open credits that we don't know about? You want to get that money back, obviously. So if you haven't been doing that, that's kind of a no-brainer. And if you do find a credit on a statement that was due to a duplicate payment, you want to investigate because you know what they say about where there's smoke, there's fire. Or as I like to say, where there's a duplicate payment once, it might happen more than once. And so you want to investigate what happened, figure out was there a weakness in your controls and your processes, and then fix it. Okay, you want to close that loophole, whatever it may be. Also, you want to be very careful about those vendors who change the invoice number, and many of them do. Some of them will just add like an A to the end of the invoice number for the first copy that they sent out and a B for the second copy, but others are change the invoice number completely. So you want to be very careful about those vendors. And when you figure out who they are, you want to make a special notice of them so that you can always check to make sure that you don't have them. Okay. So be very careful about them. And again, when you find a duplicate, you want to analyze what was wrong, what went wrong in our system so that we made this payment. Now, some of you, hopefully not you, but a few people out there might be sitting there thinking, saying, well, we don't make duplicate payments. Our system won't allow it or whatever reason that you have. Let me just say this. Maybe you don't make duplicate payments often, but saying you never make a duplicate payment is like saying you never make a mistake. I like to say, from my lips to God's ears, everybody does occasionally. And by the way, if it's only occasionally and your staff makes one, you know, take it into consideration that this is something that happens everywhere. Now, if you still think, hey, she's making a big deal about nothing, let me just point out one more issue to you. 
a lot of times a fraud in general starts off with an honest mistake. So you pay someone twice, they realize they got that second payment, they don't return it, God forbid, and then they say, aha, maybe if we send invoices twice, they'll pay twice, and they start doing it. So an honest mistake can sometimes lead to fraud, So which is why you want to stay on top of this issue. These discounts are really important to the organizations that are offering them, so it is critical you understand what they are and how they work. Early payment discounts are exactly what they claim to be, a discount for paying early. Let's take a look at the nitty gritty of how early payment discounts work. For starters, not every supplier offers them. Typically, they are negotiated during the initial stages of the business relationship. They should always be concluded in the terms and conditions. Some suppliers offer them as a matter of course, and others don't offer them at all. This is one of those situations of if you don't ask, you don't get. So ask. All they can say is no. For the purposes of this talk, we're going to focus on the most common discount offered. The discount does not have to be these numbers, but just I want to make the example and I want to make sure that you understand it. So it's 210 net 30. It is typically written the number two, a slash sign, the number 10 net, the number 30. This means that a full payment is due on the 30th day after the invoice date. However, if the invoice is paid within 10 days of the invoice date, the customer can take a 2% discount, hence the 2 slash 10. So if you had an invoice of $100, the customer has a choice of either paying $100 on the 30th day or $98 if he pays it in day 1 through 10, up to the 10th day. The $98 payment is arrived at by taking 2% of $100, which is $2, and subtracting it from the total amount of $100. Dollars. Any payment after the 10th day up until the 30th day should be the full $100. There are no partial discounts in the early payment discount world. You'll sometimes see the term early payment discount or early pay discount abbreviated as EPD. Now, you may be looking at this simple example and wondering, why would anybody make a big deal about this? She's talking about $2. So the answer is twofold. First of all, the smaller dollar amounts add up. And secondly, for most organizations, early payment discounts represent the best financial alternative they have. The 210 net 30 converts to a 36% rate of return. For most organizations, unless you're out there collecting money with a baseball bat, which I'm thinking you're not if you're listening to this, this is probably the highest rate of return your company can get with absolutely no risk. I'll skip the math for now, but perhaps we'll do another broadcast showing it. So if you're interested, let us know in the comments below. So as many companies would like to get more early payment discounts, your suppliers are not such a big fan of it, okay? So it's up to you to ferret out these opportunities. Here are three quick ways to do that. So number one, pretty simple, make sure you earn all the early payment discounts you're entitled to. This means identifying those vendors who offer early payment discounts and then fast tracking the processing for those so that you're able to get them paid within the 10th date. For many organizations, it is difficult to get an invoice processed, approved, and scheduled for payment in such a short time. But that's what you need to do. You need to also stay on top of your approvers because that's often where the holdup is. And make sure they understand that approving quickly is important in this case. Okay, that's tip number one. Tip number two, Many times, offering an early payment discount will be a standard within a particular industry. So if you have a vendor that is offering you an early payment discount, look at all the other vendors in the same industry that you are doing business with, and then approach them and ask them if they offer early payment discounts. Some will, some won't. Again, they don't like it, so they're not going to volunteer the information, but if you approach them, they may relent. Tip number three. You want to train your processes to look at invoices closely. 
And if it's on one invoice that you get where you normally don't get it, know that this vendor is probably offering it to others. So ask. So if you're doing business with vendor, you know, X, Y, Z, and they don't offer you early payment discounts and you typically don't get one. And one of your processes knows that one invoice comes through and it's showing an early payment discount. This means that they might be offering it to some of their other customers. And so you want to ask, see if you can get to be one of them. Again, if you don't ask, you won't get uh, discrepancies when they're doing the three-way match. They need to be resolved and they need to be resolved quickly. Let's take a brief but deep dive into how you can do that. What do you do with the data related to the accounts payable process three-way matches that go wrong, i.e. when you match the invoice against the purchase order and the receiving document and they don't match? There's a wealth of business intelligence in that data if you choose to collect and analyze it. And I'm sure you're going to realize that I'm going to recommend that you do that. It can and should be used to drive process improvements across your entire procured pay chain, not just the accounts payable fund. And let's talk about tracking discrepant invoices. You absolutely should be tracking them. You can do it in your ERP system if you have the functionality to do that, but many ERP systems don't have the functionality. And so someone, usually the accounts payable manager, does it in a separate spreadsheet. You can just do it in a simple Excel spreadsheet. And you want to do this for a number of reasons. Obviously, you want to get the invoices discrepancies resolved, but you also want to do it in a timely manner. Because if you don't do it in a timely manner and the due date passes, the vendor will send a second invoice. So you'll have one copy of the invoice, and then you'll get another copy of the invoice. And if it still is not resolved by, let's say, 60 days, if payment was due at 30 days, you'll get still another copy of the invoice. And maybe you'll get more than them. So a lot of extra work, a lot of extra invoices, and occasionally some of those invoices get paid twice, those second and third copies, and we absolutely don't want to do it. So here's how you can do it. Let's assume that the accounts payable manager, the director of accounts payable, maybe an assistant controller is going to do it. And what you're going to do is you're going to take a spreadsheet and you're going to keep track of the discrepant invoices and who's supposed to resolve them. Now, I'm not going to start ranting and raving about the fact that most of the time the responsibility for resolving discrepant invoices lies in accounts payable when accounts payable is the group or the person who has the least amount of information, be that as it may, but it's usually in accounts payable. And you're going to create this spreadsheet and you're going to have columns across the top and you're going to try and capture every possible piece of information. So you'll have the invoice, the date, the date that you got it, who was the purchaser, who was the supplier, who was the AP person, and any other relevant people who were associated with this. Then you're going to put common reasons why the match might fail. Let's say inaccurate invoice, pricing error. You know, there's a million other reasons. You know what they are. And a lot of them will be peculiar to your organization. You're also going to date this. You're going to date when the invoice came in, when the problem was identified, when the emails were sent out either to purchasing or to your supplier to try and get it resolved. And you're going to keep track of this. You can use this for two reasons. Number one, for tracking purposes, to make sure that you get these discrepancies resolved in a decent amount of time quickly, so you don't get those second invoices that I talked about, and also for analytical purposes, so that you can try and use them as I'm about to describe. You're going to have a comment field also in this, and you are also going to put dates down, when the problem was identified, how long it took different people to respond, and when it was resolved. Okay, and you want to make sure your invoices don't languish and you also want to collect this data. Now, periodically, and what I mean by periodically will depend upon your organization. If you only have one or two discrepant invoices, let's say a month, well, this isn't going to work for you. But I suspect if you're like 99 and three quarters percent of the people who I encounter, this is not the case. So periodically, it could be weekly, it could be monthly, it could be quarterly, depending upon what your workflow is, what other work you're doing and the nature of your business, you're going to pull the spreadsheet out 
and you're going to review it and you're going to sort the data and try and identify common problems. So, for example, you might sort the data and review by reason, reason for the discrepancy, which, by the way, you're going to enter onto the spreadsheet afterwards when the item is resolved. So a little extra work maybe in keeping the spreadsheet up. Maybe then you'll discover that one of your processes in AP has an inordinate amount of the problems. Or perhaps you're having poor purchase orders come out of a particular unit in purchasing, whatever. You're going to review this data. So yeah. now you've identified the problem and you need to take action. Now, I would strongly suggest that you start with any problems that may be in AP so that when people start pointing fingers and saying, well, did you look in your own house? You have some data to back it up and say, yes, we did and we fixed our problems. So if the problem is in accounts payable, is it with one person, one group? You want to talk to that person, maybe even if it's just like one particular processor and maybe their manager and see what's the problem. Do we need more training? Maybe that person was new and didn't get adequate training. Maybe you had an automation solution and the training that you was given was, you know, good for six of the people on your staff, but this one person didn't understand something. Or maybe they're sloppy and they just need to take more care. But be very careful about assuming you know, that somebody is sloppy. Maybe getting two screens for your processes. Maybe that would help. I was on a call this morning where I heard people are talking about getting three screens and a few people even getting four screens. So you can see where we're going with that. Okay. So that's, you know, once you've narrowed down your AP issue. Now, let's say the problem was inaccurate purchase orders. Let's say that's what you discovered was the problem. Maybe in this place, the supplier is notifying purchasing of pricing errors, and rather than issuing a corrected purchase order, the purchasing person figures, eh, accounts payable will catch it. Well, that's not acceptable. That creates more work for AP, and it also increases the chances that maybe something will slip through and you'll pay more than you should. So maybe there's one area in purchasing. Maybe one location is making all the mistakes. And in that case, maybe there was more training that's needed. So there are many different reasons. Once you identify the reason, then you can talk very tactfully, I might add, to the group involved and try and get that fixed so that the errors related to that particular cause or I want to say eliminated, but you know, for my lips to God's ears. Okay. Now, if the problem is with the invoices, you need to tread very carefully because you don't want to offend the supplier, especially if it's a large supplier. And this might be something that you might have to work with purchasing and maybe approach them together. And it could be honestly that you'll talk to them and nothing changes. And, you know, you can't make them do something. I mean, maybe you cannot do business with them, but I doubt that the organization is going to decide not to do business with them because accounts payable isn't happy with the invoices that they sent. Just a sad fact of life. So keep in mind that even after you talk to them, you may not be able to fix the problem. And if you can't, okay, this doesn't mean, you know, just give up. Just make a note of who that vendor is. You won't have a lot of them. There'll only be a few that will fall into this category. And then once you know who they are, you always double and triple check their invoices. Yes, it's extra work, but you don't want to pay them twice. Clearly, that's an unacceptable outcome. You may think that if you do everything that is explained here, all your invoices should sail through and you'd have no errors, duplicate payments, frauds, unhappy suppliers, or even unhappy management. Sadly, it's not that simple and invoice errors still have a way of sneaking in. Next, I want to talk about internal controls as they are critical to avoiding costly mistakes. Effective control in accounts payable boils down to one simple thing, the details. I've identified a baker's dozen of places where controls often go awry in the accounts payable process and will explain how this happens when it's often not that obvious at first glance. While it's great to be a big picture person, there is, and there's definitely a place for that, ignoring the details and your profits go out the door. Let me explain. Control weaknesses, especially internal controls, are the tiny cracks in your foundation. And as you know, 
tiny cracks become bigger cracks and if not taken care of can bring a whole entire building down in the business world this means losses which sadly will grow and have the potential to eventually torpedo the financial viability of your organization when criminals recognize them and take advantage let's get started looking at the promised baker's dozen of control weaknesses including those that many don't realize they have control weakness number one ineffective training when you hire someone especially when you hire someone to work in accounts payable you need to train them on how you want to do things if you don't they'll do things the way either they think they should be done or the way they did them at their old company either of those may be fine but they may not be fine and inevitably they will introduce weaknesses into your process which will result in duplicate payments duplicate invoices uh, being paid twice and other control problems control weakness number two not using a coding standard now many think people no not many some people think that as we are moving towards automation the use of a coding standard or requiring that your folks use a coding standard when they're entering data in the in the accounts payable is not important anymore it is because even those companies that are highly automated in their accounts payable function still have a certain amount of data entry and that you don't want your processes introducing errors into your system because they didn't use the coding standard when they are uh, entering the data on those few items whether they are resolving discrepancies or they're handling those few invoices that were not sent in through your automation process so you still need that coding standard control weakness number three not standardizing your process for handling invoices when you're getting them ready for payment by standardizing your processes that means that if an invoice comes in a second time and you handled it the first time and I get it the second time if I'm doing the exact same steps I'll quickly recognize that this is a duplicate and I won't set it up for payment a second time so standardize your processes not only that when you standardize your processes you can make sure that all the controls that need to be in place are in place and you don't stand the risk of somebody missing an important step hey guys I just realized I didn't introduce myself I'm Mary Schaefer founder of this channel and the AP Nail podcast which now has over 600 episodes and I hope when you're done with this one when you finish with this one you'll listen to a few others or watch a few others I've also written over 20 business books most focusing on business and accounts payable issues but enough about me let's go on to and talk about control weakness number four which is not using that coding standard in the master vendor file when you're setting up new vendors um, it's just as important and maybe even more important that you use this coding standard that should match your invoice coding standard so that um, when vendors are set up in the master vendor file your processes will be able to easily find them and they'll be able to match them to the invoice and you don't end up with duplicate vendors in the master vendor file because that is a prime way that uh, fraud is facilitated number one and number two uh, that invoices get get process twice okay so use the coding standard when setting up vendors both new and when you're making changes in the vendor file control weakness number five allowing multiple people to make changes in the master vendor file now we haven't talked about appropriate separation of duties and don't worry you're not going to get through this without me doing that but when it comes to master vendor file there should be a person who is responsible for that or two people if you're a large enough organization and no one else should be going in the master vendor file too often we'll see a processor going in and making like an address change or a bank account change you don't want to do that because then you have, you know too many hands in the pie not appropriate separation of duties so make sure that all changes to the master vendor file are made by the person who's responsible for it and no one else has the ability to do it even not not only that they're not supposed to do it on a regular basis but they don't have the ability to do it because if they do and they are of devious mind they could go in and make changes that would result in a fraudulent payment okay along the same lines control weakness number six not regularly cleansing the master vendor file so that you get rid of inactive vendors vendors that you are not doing business with anymore you don't want to get rid of that information you just want to deactivate their their entries so that 
nobody can use that that file that inactive file if you will to uh, push through a, a fraudulent payment so regularly cleanse the master vendor file otherwise it just also it gets too big and unwieldy especially if you had a lot of one-time vendors in there which some people put in and some don't but I'm getting off topic and let me get back topic to control weakness number seven not doing a periodic review of how your processes are doing their work to ensure that they haven't introduced shortcuts which also introduce weaknesses into the system not to say that all shortcuts will introduce weaknesses some of them will be true shortcuts and a benefit for everyone but oftentimes what the shortcut does is it makes the person who who creates it makes their job a little easier makes their job go a little faster but at the same time it does that it can either creates a control weakness someplace else within the process or creates a problem for somebody somebody else so you want to if they have a shortcut if they have a suggestion for a shortcut that's great you want to sit down you want to talk to them about it and if it is truly a good idea then everybody should use it not just them and but oftentimes as I say when you review it and you can see the big picture remember I told you there's a place with big picture of folks uh, when you can see the big picture you'll realize that this this is not a good change and then you can explain to them why it's not a good idea where the problems would co- would come okay control weakness number eight understanding vendor credits now if you're the manager you probably understand vendor credits very well and you will recognize them uh, very well also but if you're new to accounts payable or new to accounting or even if you're not new if nobody's ever explained them to you you the staff probably won't recognize the vendor credit and more importantly won't know what to do with it so when a vendor credit comes through because they often do look like uh, invoices they will go ahead and pay it so you want to make sure they understand vendor credits they know what to do with them and um, of course you want to try and collect as many of these as you can because that's money owed your company and you should get it back control weakness number nine employee em, em, not employing verification routines so that you don't pay a supplier twice first of all if you pay somebody twice you know by mistake it happens number one in all likelihood they won't return the money they may issue a vendor credit they may not issue a vendor credit even if they do issue a vendor credit they may you may or may not get it there's a a variety of reasons for that but even worse than all that is there are a few suppliers out there who if you pay them twice they'll say hmm these guys don't have their act together Uh, maybe I'll try and get them to pay us twice more frequently and that is what they will do so you want to employ routines to make sure you don't pay uh, twice you want to do some verification and then you want to do some after the fact checking now before we get to our last few control weaknesses I'd like to request that if you're getting any value from this that you hit that thumbs up or like button it helps us get wider distribution on our talks which in turn provides us with the necessary collateral to make more talks like this to help you control weakness number 10 um, vendor inquiries not taking them seriously um, you want to make sure that you understand all the calls that are coming in from your vendors sometimes you'll have vendors who will try and manipulate manipulate your processes they'll either bully them into paying them twice uh, uh, a few of them will um, of course they don't say pay me twice they'll pretend that they haven't been paid at all and then try and get the processor to uh, issue a second payment without spending the appropriate time verifying that the first payment may, was, wasn't made and the second thing that occasionally you'll see a vendor doing is they will try and get a processor to pay them early Uh, and while that's certainly nowhere near as damaging as having somebody pay twice it is uh, not in the best interest of your organization and they shouldn't be doing it so they'll either pull on their heart strings you know I need the money or they'll they'll say something oh that payment was supposed to go out or whatever they just kind of cajole the process into into paying them early and you don't want this I could talk a lot more about that but, but I won't you get where I'm going okay control weakness number 11 not requiring mandatory vacations every organization should have a policy that anyone who has anything to do with 
their money takes five consecutive days off during which time somebody else does their job um, and they are out of the office. You don't want them being out of the office, being working from home and then doing their job from home because that negates what you're trying to achieve. What you want to make sure is that there's no fraud going on actually, but you really don't want to say that. Um, and so somebody else does the job and the feeling is that within the five days, if there was an ongoing fraud, that um, it would become uncovered. Now, many companies don't have this this policy uh, mainly because they are you know people take take all their vacation time. But you don't want someone, even though I understand why they might like to do it, if they get ten week if they get two weeks vacation, taking you know every Friday in the summer off, and they just have some long weekends because they didn't plan to go anyplace. Well, that's nice. It doesn't cover you on your five consecutive days off. So you, you want to do that. Control weakness number twelve. I promised it was coming, not employing appropriate separation of duties. And this is getting harder and harder for more companies as our accounts payable departments use more and more technology and they get smaller and smaller. It becomes harder and harder to employ appropriate separation of duties. But if you don't, you will end up or you could end up with a situation where a person has um, access to two legs of a transaction and if they have a devious heart, then they are more apt to uh, make it easier for them to, to commit fraud if that's how they are so inclined. And while most of your people absolutely will not do that, you don't know who will. And in fact, that brings me to control weakness number 13. I call it the myth of the long-term trusted employee. Most employees who've been with you for a long time are very honorable. So I don't want to give you the uh, impression that there's not, but there are a few who use their uh, position of trust, if you will, to have the the uh, appropriate separation of duties, they're not in place, uh, and they have access to more things than they could. And a few of them will take advantage and rob, rob their uh, employer. And in, in fact, in most cases where there is an internal fraud, especially when that internal fraud is due, due to um, inappropriate separation of duties or weakened internal controls, it will turn out that it's a long-term trusted employee who uh, has taken, taken advantage because they know where the weaknesses are and you've kind of let your guard down and you're not checking them as much as maybe you're checking that new employee or that guy who you think he looks a little shady even though he doesn't he's a perfectly um, nice guy so that's why I call it the myth of the long-term trusted employee so your internal controls across the board no exceptions no matter how long someone's been with you and how much you trust them where you think they are honorable so I could spend several hours discussing fraud protection protocols but today We'll just focus on a important tip. Look through the other talks on this channel for more information on fraud protection. Getting hit with a fraud when you're in charge can be devastating, even when you had absolutely nothing to do with it. What's more, management often feels that someone has to take the hit for what happened and they terminate or demote the manager who was in charge, figuring that they should have had tighter controls in place to prevent this kind of thing from happening. That's why we put together this quick rundown of fraud protection practices everyone should be using. Issue number one, I call this the issue no one likes to, com to confront. I've been covering accounts payable issues for almost 25 years now. And whenever I mention this one, people get uncomfortable. Sometimes they give me dirty looks, but it is a fact of business life. So we need to address it and we're going to address it now. When it comes to fraud, fraud can be both internal and external. That's right. It's not always something bad guy out there. It's sometimes it is somebody that you know and actually like. This is why we make a big deal about internal controls across the board, no exception, because there is what I call the myth of the long-term trusted employee. Now, most long-term trusted employees are quite honorable and they would never think of doing anything to harm their uh, organization, but there's always that one bad apple. And in fact, surveys from the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners have shown year after year that when there is an ongoing fraud uh, committed by an internal person, 
trusted an employee, it inevitably is that long-term trusted employee, that person you think they would never, never do anything. Um, so uh, I'm going to stop talking about this, but I want to conclude this little section of this talk, if you will, um, with a hashtag uh, for my colleague, Kelly, Kelly Paxton. She came up with this and she says, hashtag trust is not an internal control. So anytime you hear yourself saying, oh, that's Joe or that's Jane, we don't have to worry about it. You're probably right, but you don't want to take that chance that you're not. Okay. Issue number two. This is one that I call the high alert issue. Um, and if I was doing this talk even a year ago, I probably wouldn't have mentioned it, but today it is critical, okay? And that is when you're you know, going about your day-to-day -day operations, anything that occurs that is different or out of the ordinary, especially when it relates to your money, um, you need to stop, you need to question it, and you never you need to verify it. And it's the little things, um, because criminals um, are quite good at figuring their way around. Let me give you a very simple example. If normally you're the accounts payable manager and you're doing the wire transfers and usually, and it's always the controller who brings you the wire transfer, and this time you get an email from the CFO with the wire, uh, with the wire transfer directly, not going um, through the controller, um, and it says something like, uh, this is a rush, we need to hurry up and get it out. I mean, maybe it is from this the CFO, and maybe it is a rush and you need to do, get it out, but take a few extra minutes to stop and confirm because I can't tell you how many times this little out of the ordinary that doesn't really seem that much out of the ordinary has been a fraud. Okay, issue number three. I call this one yet another variation of this devastating fraud. And this had actually happened in the town that I live in. Um, so it's near and dear to my heart, or at least according to the newspaper it is. And the manager who was in charge was fired. So we all know that we verify all those emails that come in that have a change of bank account request, but you need to verify those changes regardless of how that, that uh, request comes to you. So in this case, the uh, hacking actually did not occur in the uh, customers in the town's uh, accounts payable system. It ha actually happened in the supplies and the accounts receivable um, department or the billing department. And what the criminal did is they changed the invoices. So the invoices had a little statement on it that said, uh, you know, please send funds to our new bank account, and it gave the bank account number. And of course, people getting this, they received the email, it was from a legitimate source, it was from an invoice that they were expecting, and they went ahead and changed the bank account without without verifying it. So even if it seems like it's ironclad, this has got to be accurate, go ahead and verify it. And because in this case it wasn't, and you know, there was a lot of trouble afterwards. Okay, um, issue number four. I call this the alert the alert issue you want to be alert for new frauds and you want to be alert for them before you come victim this is kind of a variation in the last tip where you know the change of bank account now came on the invoice um, instead of the request coming through email so keep in mind criminals are really smart or at least some of them are um, and they look for weaknesses and they figure out ways to exploit them ways that you and I would never have have thought so be continually alert and if something looks, you know, a little odd, then you want to question it. Issue number five. I call this putting on your hacking hat. Hacking hat. Can you say that fast five times? Okay. Annually, you want to become an ethical hacker or you want one of your employees to do that. Um, you want to keep in mind that when it comes to taking advantage, um, your employees know where your weaknesses are. And when I say your employees, I'm including ex-employees. And at the end of the day, you never really know who is disgruntled who is having financial issues or what weaknesses they may, they may exist. So once a year, put on your hacking hat and see if you can break the system, so to speak. See if you can uh, figure out a way that you could defraud the organization. And then, of course, if you figure it out, you want to fix that. A great way to do this, by the way, is if you hire somebody new, if you have a new employee, um, have them look through it your system and see where they, they see the weaknesses are because they are going to look at things with a little different
different set of eyes than you would look at it. And they um, also, you know, come from a little bit of different background. So it's really, that's kind of like getting a, a, a consultant for free. So don't overlook those new employees. Let them try and break your system. Okay, the next issue I call the non-discriminatory issue. And that is, I'm going to make it clear that when it comes to crime, everybody is a target, even in the corporate world. Okay, there's no exceptions. Criminals will take advantage of whoever they can. Uh, some statistics from the Association of Financial Professionals showed that with these new electronic payment frauds, 61% of them was were focused on the accounts payable staff. Okay, and depending upon the fraud, um, there's different targets. And I just want to go through a few of them quickly that we've seen in recent times. Um, CFOs have had their emails either hacked or impersonated. Um, and then uh, uh, an email is sent requesting a rush wire transfer. It's usually sent to somebody in AP or whoever within the organization is doing your wire transfers. CEOs have had their emails hacked and is sending out requests for personnel information um, in, in the most famous case, if you will. I hate to use the word famous in this example, but it is um, notorious that they got the W-9s. This, this problem has become so bad that the IRS issued a warning to all companies saying as a best practice anytime there was an email request from a high-level executive requesting personnel information tax information that that should be verified before that information is said because there have been so many of these uh, phony emails that unfortunately people uh, fell for you know the email came from the CEO or some other high-level executive the employee wanted to look good and so they immediately sent the information unfortunately to the criminal okay your account payable department is getting inundated and they continue to get inundated um, with both phony wire transfer requests supposedly from the CEO or the CFO as we've discussed and also from uh, criminals who are impersonating your your true vendors uh, trying to get you to uh, send a payment to one of their bank accounts instead of to the uh, supplier so they have to be verified. Payroll has been, been, um, been a target uh, with these requests for personnel information and then basically any employee for the last few years we have this gift card scam going on where the criminals ask uh, send an email to employ different level employees asking them to uh, go out and buy gift cards and then they the criminals can turn that into that information the information on the cards into cash and either the employee or the company is out the money um, showing just how smart they are one company told me they got hit several times with the, this fraud and they couldn't understand it because they were updating they you know they were doing a good job at updating their employees or so they thought and then they realized what the criminals were doing is anytime they got a new employee who hadn't been there and seen the former alerts they were um, targeting them and of course new employee want to look good and, and, you, and you can figure out the rest so now that organization had to make uh, training about not falling for the skip card scam part of their new employee training okay Okay, next issue. Um, I call this the blabbermouth issue. I say this is the one time it's good to be a blabbermouth within your organization. Normally that's that's not a compliment, but as soon as you hear of a new fraud, spread the word and spread it quickly. Don't wait for the weekly staff meeting or the monthly staff meeting. It may be too late then. And as I hope I've managed to convey to you, it's important that you spread this word to everybody, not just um, you know the manager or the higher-ups okay so as soon as you hear about a fraud even if it's one that you guys fell for don't get hit a second time don't be embarrassed spread the word and I love it when people tell me because then I can be the blabbermouth and spread spread the work okay and then the last issue and this one if only the employee had followed this would have saved his organization 25 million dollars and this is trust your gut okay I call this trust your gut issue if something feels off take a minute step back Back, look at it ask a few questions make a few few calls um, in this case it was a 25 million dollars it was it was in Hong Kong uh, the employee was instructed via a zoom call that turned out to be a deep fake um, of the CFO uh, to you know send money which ultimately he did but throughout the whole thing he felt something was off he couldn't put his finger on it and eventually when they figured it out uh, they went to the police which is how I know about it because it was it was in the press and unfortunately the money was gone but felt something was just not right.
Now, we're going to take a look at vendor management, and of course, that includes the master vendor file. Today, we're going to take a closer look at some key master vendor file management issues that are sadly not always addressed. So we're all on the same page and start by defining what is the master vendor file. The master vendor file is the repository of information needed to pay vendors or suppliers. Each supplier should be in the master vendor file once and only once. But that is easier said than done unless very rigid, strict best practices are used around the master vendor file function. To those not familiar with this issue, this might seem like not a big deal, but it is. Some of them will say, what's the big deal? What can go wrong if the supplier is listed a second time in the master vendor file? First, let me state the obvious. When a supplier gets into the master vendor file a second time, it is a sign that internal controls are not nearly as strong as they should be. That second entry shows a breakdown of controls someplace. This is a problem because it makes it easier for the processor to mistakenly pay a vendor a second time. And as many of those who are involved in the accounts payable and payment function know, duplicate payments are rarely returned voluntarily. That's bad enough, but a duplicate vendor in the master vendor file also facilitates fraud, something not many think about. Less than honorable employees trying to play games by submitting phony invoices, for example, know they need to have a vendor file for it to go again. If there's an inactive or duplicate entry that can provide them the cover they need, then they're good to go. There's an even more heartbreaking issue. If you have a duplicate entry in the master vendor file and unintentionally double pay a less than honorable supplier, that supplier may realize you have control issues and amp up their efforts to get you to double pay again. They may do this by submitting copies of invoices to several individuals in your organization, creating tons of extra work for your accounts payable staff, even if they don't eventually double pay. Or they may resubmit invoices that have already been paid. Whatever they do, it's not good. It's extra work for you. They either trick you into paying twice or create a whole lot of extra work for your staff. And as I said, neither of those are a good thing. Not everyone refers to the master vendor file as the master vendor file. What are some of the other names used for the master vendor file? Some refer to it as the vendor master file and others simply call it the vendor file. Now in some companies, different departments will have their own vendor files to address whatever their own particular needs are. In fact, Sometimes even purchasing will have its own vendor file separate from the one used in accounts payable, but that is not too common. This brings up the next issues related to master vendor file. Who has responsibility for the master vendor file? Now, let me be clear. There is no absolute right or wrong answer to this question. The first consideration and most important relates to appropriate separation of duties. The responsibility should lie with the group that has enough personnel to handle the function appropriately while still maintaining appropriate separation of duties. As technology takes over more and more of the transactional work in the accounts payable function, the accounts payable departments, like many others, are getting smaller and smaller. So while accounts payable might seem like the logical place to house responsibility for the accounts payable function, Smaller staff sometimes make that impossible for the appropriate separation of duties issues. Once you've addressed the appropriate separation of duty issue, the next issue is who has the bandwidth to handle the day-to-day -day tasks related to the master vendor file on a very current basis. You can't leave new vendors set up until the end of the month and set them all up at one time then. While this may seem like an ideal situation for the person who has to set the vendors up, it's not ideal for the operation of the business. Since an invoice can't be processed until the vendor is set up, you need to put this responsibility with someone who will set up new vendors and make changes to existing vendors every day or every second day. Now, the temptation is to let invoice processes set up new vendors and make changes to existing vendors, but this creates a control issue as it negates appropriate separation of duties. So as tempting as it may be, don't do it. Another tempting issue is to leave all suppliers in the master vendor file forever in case you want to do business with them again in the future and then you won't have to set them up again. The problems with this are several. After a number of years, the master vendor file will be large, unwieldy, and rife with opportunities for error and worse. 
So let's address the lifespan of a supplier in the master vendor file. Does a lot does a supplier stay in the master vendor file forever? Technically, the answer to that is yes, but they should be deactivated if you haven't done business with them in the last 12 or 14 months. Leaving an inactive vendor in the master vendor file, just like a duplicate vendor, can facilitate fraud if you have an employee looking to play games. And by this, I mean looking to defraud the company, usually, although not always, through embezzlement. This is called cleansing the master vendor file. The vendor history should not be deleted. This way, if the supplier comes back two years from now and claims you didn't pay a particular invoice, and yes, that happens, you have the records to research and prove that you did. Basically, a supplier should stay active in the master vendor file as long as you continue to do business with that supplier on a regular basis. Once you stop doing business, the supplier can be deactivated but you will always have the history of that relationship. Really important. If you start doing business with that supplier again, you should re-verify their information as if they were a brand new supplier. This brings up the issue of setting up vendors in the master vendor file. What's involved with setting up a new vendor? It first involves entering data provided by the new supplier. Often this information is taken directly from the invoice. And while there is nothing inherently wrong with this approach, assuming you are verifying that it's a little legitimate vendor, more on that a little bit later, there are better ways. Ideally, you'll have a vendor form or application and will also send the new supplier a W-9 from which you'll collect taxpayer identification number and an ACH payment form to collect bank account data so you can pay them electronically using the ACH. This can either be sent by the person responsible for the master vendor file or by the purchasing professional, ideally before they send the first purchase order. However, in reality, most accounts payable departments don't find out about a new vendor until that first invoice arrives. And then they have to hustle to get the vendor information collected and given to the person responsible for the master vendor file. You should also do some basic verifications before making that first payment. Now, before we get to those verifications, if you're getting value from this talk, I would love it if you'd hit the like or the thumbs up button. It sends a message that you are getting value from this talk and I should make more like it. Personal thanks from me to everyone who has hit that button. What basic verifications should you do on the master vendor file data when setting up a new vendor? Once the data is collected, the information on the W-9 needs to be run through IRS TIN matching program to verify if the name and the TIN match what the IRS has on its records. This will greatly reduce the number of B notices you receive, which, if you've ever had to deal with them, you know is a huge pain in the you-know-what and wastes a lot of valuable time. If there is a mismatch, get the information corrected from the supplier and run it through IRS TIN matching again. Do this until it's correct. You want to do this before you make the first payment. The reason for this is simple. As long as the supplier is waiting for their money, they are more likely to comply with your requests. Once you make the payment, the power dynamic shifts, especially if there are new, new orders forthcoming. At that point, doing what you ask becomes a very low priority for your supplier. It is strongly recommended that this tin matching be done when the supplier is first set up. Some organizations wait until the end of the year and then run either all their suppliers or all new supplies through IRS tin matching. Then they try and correct any mismatches. It's much harder to do at that point for the reasons discussed above, plus some of your original contacts may have left their positions and tracking down their replacements and getting them to correct the old information will be a real trick of diplomacy. Companies should also verify that their suppliers are not on the most current SDN, specially designated nationals list with the US Treasury, something that was not considered a best practice until recently. The U.S. Treasury's list of specially designated nationals is a list of folks the U.S. government does not want its citizens or what it calls U.S. persons, includes U.S. companies and other organizations doing business in the U.S., doing business with. It includes terrorists from the OFAC list as well as drug dealers and others, and you may not pay them. You may recall when Russia invaded the Ukraine, several Russian entities were added to this list. A word of caution. Expect to get some false positives. So no heart failure when running your new supplier through the list and you get a hit. Investigate. In all likelihood, you will find an entity with a similar name 
or one located in a different country. The last verification that you should do up front involves running the addresses of your new supplier against the addresses in your HR file. The purpose of this is to identify any employee trying to set up a phantom vendor. You won't find many, but when you find one, you will have saved your organization lots of money and headache. It really is very simple to do. But as with other matches, investigate before accusing. There could be a good reason for the match. If you reach the conclusion that there is some game playing going on, get your boss and someone from HR involved before you make accusations. From this, you should take away that your investigation should not involve asking the suspected culprit about the match. This brings up the issue of verification for changes of data in existing suppliers' information. What verifications, if any, should be done when there is a change of information request made for an existing supplier? It's real simple. Any change should be verified. As you can probably guess, this has only become a necessity in the last few years. This has gotten critically important with the explosion of those emails impersonating the CFO or other high-level executive requesting a rush wire transfer, as well as emails from existing suppliers requesting a change of bank account for an ACH. Most are legitimate, but the few that are phony have been a real problem. Now, it's imperative because of this that all these requests be verified and regrettably, this involves picking up the phone and calling. The process of tracking down the right person and doing the verification can be time consuming, but not doing it can be costly if you send the money to a crook. So smart companies now verify every single one of these requests, even though, as I said, most are completely legitimate. We're going to touch briefly now on payments. Guest, I believe many payments being made today with checks could be made with either cards or ACH. Do you agree? Is your organization trying to reduce the number of paper checks? Let us know in the comments below. Cards are the perfect payment tool to handle small dollar invoices, which may be clogging up your accounts payable. Used with the proper control, you can eliminate a large number of invoices and then have your AP team spend their valuable processing time on larger dollar invoices. There have been many new card product introductions in recent years, so you might want to take a look at them. When reviewing all the advantages of card programs, keep in mind your supplier's needs as well. While many are happy and even prefer to take cards for, let's say, a $100 transaction, you may find their joy fading quickly if you try and get them to take it for a $100,000 invoice, even with a reduced fee. ACH payments have been growing in popularity as many recognize the drawbacks of paying with a paper check. ACH payments are electronic payments, but they are not instantaneous. It is important that you realize that. They have been used successfully for years now for direct deposit of payroll and direct deposit of Social Security. In growing numbers, companies are now using them to pay their suppliers. In fact, in the U.S., ACH payments in the B2B world now exceed 50% of the payments made. While we celebrate crossing this threshold, the rest of the world looks at us incredulously, as most make almost 100% of their payments electronically. I've had non-U.S. people tell me things like, I don't even know where my checkbook is. And when COVID hit, our management said, no more paper checks. ACH can be used in place of many wire transfers as they are quite a bit less expensive and in place of paper checks, as we've already discussed. As you may have guessed, not only has there been a lot of innovation in the payment world, there's a lot more coming in the next few months and years and it's already started. Did you know that there are 11 different types of cards used in the business world and that there are four different types of ACH payments? As always, we appreciate your thumbs up as they help our channel grow. As YouTube takes your thumbs up as a sign they should share this content with more folks just like you. Before we move on, we need to address 1099s. 1099s, often dreaded by the accounts payable departments, represent a critical yet a challenging aspect of tax compliance. This burden is particularly pronounced in January, a month that's already filled with tasks for organizations whose fiscal 
calendar year end is the same as the calendar year end. The urgency intensifies as these forms must be mailed to recipients by January 31st, or delivered to recipients by then, to facilitate timely tax filing. Today we're going to provide a very basic understanding of what these forms are, as well as some of the new forms on the horizon and the problems these new forms are causing, sharing insights essential for the navigating this intricate landscape of tax reporting that often falls on the head of the Accounts Payable Department. So let's get started with a series of questions and answers. It sounds like there's more than one 1099. Is that true? That is 100% accurate. There are a number of these forms, each for a different purpose and each with its own headaches. Why aren't 1099s handled in the tax department? That's a great question and one I don't have a great answer to, but I'm going to take a guess. They're done typically in accounts payable most of the time, but not always. Sometimes the tax department does actually do them, mainly because, I believe, accounts payable has access to all the payment information. If you've got a better explanation, I'd love to see it in the comments below. What is a 1099 tax form? Very simply put, a 1099 is a form used to report income for the prior year to the recipient of the income and to the IRS. There are numerous different 1099s. Which one you use will depend upon the type of income that you're reporting. Before we delve into some of the more common types, let's discuss the relationship, if you will, between a W-2 and a 1099, since very frequently I'm asked, what's the difference between a W-2 and a 1099? Both are forms used to report income to the IRS and the recipient of that income, which you will get will depend upon the type of income received. A W-2 is filled out by an employer and is used to report wages and tax withheld, sometimes a few other things, to the IRS. A copy is given to the employee to attach to their annual tax return with the IRS when they file on or before April 15th. Now, before we get to the different types, I want to address a question that is frequently asked about these two forms. Is it better to receive a W-2 or a 1095, 1099? The answer is simple. You don't have a choice. You don't get to pick. The type of relationship you have with the entity hiring you and a few other factors determine which form you get. You do not get to choose. What are the different types of 1099s? We're going to briefly address the most common forms before taking a deeper dive into the forms generally issued by your accounts payable groups. Also be aware, by the way, that as we've discussed briefly, the IRS periodically issues new forms 1099 and regularly tweaks existing 1099 forms to adjust for market conditions and experiences. And also some states now have their own 1099 forms. The most common 1099 forms include the 1099-INT, which is used to report interest income, the 1099-B, which is used to report proceeds from a broker and barter exchange transactions. The 1099-DIV, D-I-V, is used to report dividends and distributions. The 1099-C is used to report the cancellation of debt. A 1099-R is used to report distributions from pensions and annuities, retirement or profit sharing plans, IRAs, insurance contracts, etc. We're going to discuss now the two forms accounts payable departments are most familiar with and then the two new forms. So now to the two forms we're most familiar with, what is the 1099 MISC, M-I-S-C? For the longest time, this was the only form used in accounts payable. The IRS says the 1099 MISC is used to report, drum roll please, I'm sure you can guess, miscellaneous income. This is where the payment made to your independent contractors and consultants used to be reported. Notice the emphasis on used to be. Because there was so much fraud related to criminals filing phony tax returns requesting refunds they were not entitled to, it became necessary to have income paid to these individuals to have it reported very early in the year. For a few years, it continued to be reported on the MISC, but when there were other types of miscellaneous income being reported to the same payee at a different point in the year, like in March instead of January, it became a real nightmare at the IRS, which I can understand. And so they introduced, or should I say reintroduced, because it was an old form they put out of, so to speak, put out of commission, so to speak, the NEC. So let's take a look at it. What is the 1099 NEC? The 1099 NEC is used to report non-employee compensation. This statement is deceptively simple. 
The rules for both the NEC and the NISC are quite complex, get revised or tweaked almost every single year. That's why at AP Now, my company, we bring in a tax attorney each year to do several webinars on filling out the current 1099 NISC and the 1099 NEC correctly and accurately. We want to make sure our members know how to fill out Form 1099s correctly. The rules are so complex. He has a thriving business just advising organizations organizations on the right way to fill out the forms. If you want to know how to do annual 1099 reporting for corporations for vendors or how to fill out a 1099 for an independent contractor, please visit the webinar page on the AP Now website and look for our 1099 offerings on that page. We have a few courses every fall. Before we get to the new 1099 forms, if you're getting value from this talk, I'd love it if you'd hit the like or the thumbs up button. It sends a message that you're getting value from this talk and I should make more like it. A personal thanks from me to everyone who has hit that like button. What are the new 1099 forms? There are two forms that you may have seen in the press, the 1099-K and the 1099-DA. Let's take a look at each of them separately. What is the 1099-DA? This is the form that the IRS expects to begin using in 2026 for fiscal 2025 for reporting by brokers for sales or exchange of digital assets, including cryptocurrency transactions. The goal is to simplify this reporting. As you might expect, there's been a lot of complaining about this one. What I am calling the other new form is already here, but its use is being expanded and expanded greatly, and that has led to a ton of whining. What is the 1099K? Okay, this one you're not going to be able to figure out from its name. I'm guessing they picked the K because it hadn't been used for anything else. If you know differently, please, please feel free to let us know in the comments below. And you can take a guess also if you want. Anyway, the 1099K is for reporting payment card for reporting payment card and third-party network transactions. Most companies are familiar with it if they accept credit cards. At AP Now, my company, we get 1099Ks each year, one for MasterCard and Visa, and another one from American Express to reflect the sales we made that were paid for with credit cards. Organizations like eBay also report as they are, they are third-party network. The protesting about the 1099Ks began when the IRS announced two changes. The first was that the threshold reporting, which varies depending upon the type of 1099, was being lowered for $20,000 all the way down to $600. The $600 level is more common on other types of 1099. Suddenly, a lot of people were going to have income from small side businesses reported to the IRS, but that was just the beginning of the problem. They also announced that companies like Zelle, Venmo, and Cash App would also have to start reporting. The problem here is that many of these apps are used for personal transactions, like sending money, sending money to a child at college, sending money to a friend for your half of a dinner bill when the friend charged the entire dinner bill to their credit card, or even giving a wedding gift. The problem for these third-party apps is they were given very little notice in separating the real person-to-person -person transactions from the business transactions presented with them presented them with a real and not easily solvable headache eventually the IRS relented a little beginning with tax year 2024 reporting cycle the gross payment threshold was lowered to $5,000. Sometimes I'm asked if I need to give my contractor a 1099. Usually the answer to this question is yes, despite what the contractor might be telling you. But how do you know for sure? You need to get a W-9 from the supplier and verify it using IRS TIN matching. It's really not that complicated, but you need to do it correctly. We can't talk about accounts payable today without discussing automation. Here are some tips if you're considering purchasing an automation solution. If you don't have an organized plan, shopping for an accounts payable automation solution or invoice solution or any automation solution for that matter can get quite confusing. So keep track of your requirements and who has what in either a Google Sheet or an Excel spreadsheet. This could mean the difference between a successful digital transformation and a flop. We've broken down the features you should be looking at into two groups, the must-haves and the nice-to-haves. Depending on your requirements, you may move some of the features between the two categories. Make sure you stick around until the end when we discuss the one issue few ever think about, 
until they're sitting there with a nightmare on their hand. Now, as we go through this list, at certain points, you'll be likely to think to yourself, the salesman from the automation solution provider is never going to answer that question honestly. And you will be right. That's why I strongly recommend, if you can possibly find someone using the solution, you talk to them on your own. Sadly, this won't be the references provided by the automation solution provider, so as they are likely to only share those of folks who've had a positive experience with them. You need to find them on your own, possibly by posting on LinkedIn or at an industry meeting. Let's get started with the must-have features. Must-have feature number one. Let's get the elephant in the room right out of the way up front. You want to get pricing that fits your budget. Now, to be fair, even though I hate to have to do that, your budget will determine how many of the following items you can realistically expect to get. No one goes shopping for a brand new Rolls Royce expecting to spend $20,000 or 20,000 euros. So keep this in mind. Must have feature number two, the ability to directly read the invoice that has been emailed in without any human inter interaction. In my humble opinion, this will become a standard feature, at least in the United States in the future. For without it, suppliers will continue to drag their feet at the thought of having to change their ways and utilization of your new automation solution will never be what you hoped for. The reason I stipulated the United States is that in many other parts of the world, a good portion of Europe, Asia, South America, etc., electronic invoicing mandates are becoming the norm and PDFs of invoices do not meet that definition of an invoice permittable, permittable under those protocols. But in the United States, we are nowhere near to even discussing such actions. And by the way, neither are they in the UK, but some UK representatives have been attending some of these meetings, so they're closer than we are. Must have, must have feature number three, any solution that doesn't require your suppliers to change much or ideally at all, will end up with a higher utilization than a solution that requires a change. That is because unless you are the 800 pound gorilla in the relationship with your vendors, your vendors are not going to change for you. This is why I've made such a big deal about the ability to read invoices from emails. For with this feature, your suppliers don't even have to know that you automated your invoice processing or your accounts payable function. As long as they are emailing invoices, and most of them are, they don't have to know about the change. And before you start thinking, but well, we're Microsoft or Amazon or whoever, and we're the 800 pound gorilla in all our relationships, realize that no one is the 800 pound gorilla with the utilities. They don't discriminate. You do, their, you do things their way. Must have feature number four. Now I'm gonna be honest here. I thought originally supplier self onboarding was a dream come true for the accounts payable space. And it was for the accounts payable space, but that's it. With suppliers entering their own information into the master vendor file, password protected of course, accounts payable teams would no longer have to worry about those awful phony change my bank account emails. Plus as an added benefit, it took away some of the tedious data entry work that your accounts payable team had to, had to do. So what more could you want? Well, what I had not done when considering this is walked a mile in your supplier's shoes. All it took was for me to give a talk at a credit and receivables conference advocating for the use of what I saw as these wonderful portals and one furious receivables manager screaming at me. We have 6,000 customers. Do you really expect me to have someone go in and update every single one of those vendor portals every time we make a little change? All of a sudden, I could see it from her point of view. And that was even before she started unloaded on, loading on me about taking on her customers' accounts payable work. So on my must-have feature list, I now include do not require, does not require suppliers to self-onboard. The supplier community hates this requirement, often refusing to do it, resulting in you having lower utilization of your automation solution. And you didn't pour all that work and effort in to have your suppliers not use it. Must have feature number five, scalability. Ideally, you want to purchase an automation solution that will work forever, regardless of how big or fast your organization grows. 
Of course, if your organization grows exponentially, they may be willing to spend a little bit more on the solution, and you'll be able to get one of those that has some of the fancy bells and whistles that I'm going to talk about at the end of this session. And there are quite a few of them, by the way. But that is not your consideration today. At this point, you want to find a solution that will not only accommodate you today, but will work if your organization grows quickly or acquires another company and then you have to handle their accounts payable responsibilities. Must have feature number six, good documentation that the service provider regularly updates with any and all changes. Otherwise, like your accounts payable policy and procedures manual, if it is not updated, it is not worth the paper it's printed on or in today's world, the space it takes up in the interspace or whatever you want to call it. Again, if you ask the automation solution provider, they're not going to say something like, oh no, we don't update our documentation. We hate to do that. We always have a hard time finding someone to do it. This is one of those areas where you're not going to get an honest answer if the documentation isn't being updated on a regular basis. And that is why insights from someone you find on your own who is using the same solution will be worth its weight in gold. Must have feature number seven, simple integration with your ERP, whatever it may be. If you need a good deal of IT support, this is likely to stall your project. Are you apt to get an honest answer from the service provider when you ask if integration is apt to be anything less than smooth? Probably not. There's a good chance you won't. This is where talking with someone you found on your own who has used the solution will come in handy. Also realize that the interface for certain ERPs may be better than others. So if you're talking to someone who has a different ERP system, then their experience may be different than what you have. Must have feature number eight. The solution to be as user friendly as possible so it won't require massive staff training to use for either you or your staff or your suppliers. Don't forget your suppliers. You can probably judge this yourself if they let you do a test run. You can do this or better yet, have someone on your staff do it. That person should be representative of the individuals likely to use the solution on a day to day basis. They will ask questions about the operational details that you might not think of. Must have feature number nine. There should be solution provider support for both your team and your suppliers. You don't want your suppliers calling you every single time they have a problem as you are not, as you are likely not to have the answer and you're just going to have to call the solution provider yourself to get them the answer they need. So this is one area where not all providers have robust support and you want to ferret that out up front. And if your suppliers can't use the solution or they run into a problem, they simply won't use it. And of course, that's not what you want. But if they can email you the invoice and completely sidestep and not have to interact with the solution, you won't have this problem. So remember what we discussed earlier. Must have feature number 10, automatic update anytime there is an ERP update. This probably should be at the top of your list. As you know, ERPs update whenever they feel the need and you have no control over it, especially if it's a security issue. The automation solutions provider should make whatever adjustments are needed to accommodate the, idea, the update. And in an ideal world, this would be transparent to both you and, their, and your vendors. This should be discussed upfront, especially if you are using an ERP that not many of their other customers are using. So ask how many others with the same ERP as you are using their solution. They should be able to give you that information, by the way. They don't have to tell you who they are, although it would be nice if they would, but they should be able to tell you how many. Must have feature number 11. Clearly, if they are reading invoices using OCR, you want to have a high accuracy level as you don't want to constantly have to rekey information. The solution provider will share some stats but verify this with your references. Before we get to the nice to have features, and some of them are pretty nifty, if you are finding this informative, I'd greatly appreciate it if you could hit the thumbs up or like button. It sends a message to YouTube and to us that the content has value and it should be shared with more folks like it and that we should create more like it. A big thank you from me to everyone who has hit the like button. And now on to the nice to have features. Nice to have feature number one, alerts for potential duplicate payments. 
ideally, no second copies of invoices make it through to the point of being scheduled for payment. But if you've been operating for any amount of time in the accounts payable space, you know that we don't live in that dream world and occasionally an invoice still manages to slip through. Being alerted for potential duplicates is a really nice but not necessary feature to have. Nice to have feature number two, robust reporting. Needs in this area will vary to, from organization to organization and will depend on what you can easily get from your ERP. Some of them are robust in that area, some of them aren't. But if you prepare a list of reports that you'd like to have ahead of time, you can see what the automation solutions offer and what the different ones also offer. Also, ask about how easy or difficult it is to create special reports as needed by various teams. And if you can play around with the system, you can even try and do that. Nice to have feature number three. The ability to read handwritten documents is a nice feature if, and this is a big if, you still get handwritten invoices. My guess is only a few of you do get them, but if you do, ask about it. Again, it is a nice to have and probably only something to consider if you're getting more than the occasional handwritten invoices. I know some organizations just simply refuse to accept them. They have to be typed or computer generated. Nice to have feature number four, uh, having others in your industry already using this solution. If many are using it, the provider may have developed some reports and routines that you need and are unique to your industry. So when researching, when searching, ask providers if others are in your industry are using it. But don't rely on them to figure out what your industry is, okay? Because some of them will get it right, some of them will get it wrong, they'll guess, who knows what they'll do. Um, so you want to tell them what it is. Now, you've probably figured out from what I'm saying that your ideal reference would be from someone who is facing the same issues as you are and are in the same industry. But that's, you know, an ideal. Nice to have feature number four, uh, feature number five, some level of fraud detection. Now, you should never rely 100% on the solution provider to protect you against fraud, but some features are nice. This, sadly, is something where we all need to be alert as criminals are masters at finding ways around even the best of technology. This is why I like to say, when it comes to fraud protection, it takes a village. Nice to have feature number six, dispute resolution models. They're nice to have as they make resolving discrepancies between the invoice, the purchase order, and the receiving document easier to resolve. But these models are not perfect and they only work if both parties use them. That's why this is on the nice to have list and not the must have list. Nice to have feature number seven, portals where your suppliers can go and check their payment status so they are not continually annoying your staff with calls like, did you get my invoice? When am I gonna be paid? Did you schedule my invoice for payment, etc." If you have this portal, you can then very nicely point them to the portal so they can check instead of constantly interrupting your accounts payable staff with their questions. They can check every day. They can check to their heart's content. You don't care. Of course, if they don't see their invoices scheduled for payment, you're still going to get those calls. Nice to have feature number eight. When the solution is updated, it won't require massive changes on your part. This is where your references really come in handy, especially if you can find someone on your own and not, are not relying on the references provided by the provider. One of the most heartbreaking issues for companies to face is having spent a lot of time, effort, and money on acquiring and setting up a new automation solution and then having low utilization, either because suppliers or employees balk at using this, using it. A little advanced planning will help you avoid this nightmare. Now, clearly, there's a lot more to say about technology and automation and accounts payable, and it's a really important topic. That's why we've created a comprehensive talk on the issues, which you can watch right now by clicking the link that has appeared on your YouTube screen and is in the description. Good luck.